There's nothing like it in sports. Maybe there never has been since the Roman games. Race day at the Indianapolis 500. The first 500-mile race was staged here in 1911, but that wasn't the first race at the two-and-a-half-mile oval. The honor is held by the national championship balloon race two years earlier, followed by a motorcycle race and short auto races. The idea of a massive racetrack had been building in the imagination of Carl Fisher for years. Carl Fisher was a product of his optimistic times. Electricity, the telephone, the phonograph, motion pictures, all created a revolution in the speed and capability of communications, economies, and imaginations. On a parallel course, motorized contraptions of all kinds were taking us to new heights, and the heartland of the nation was in the middle of innovations. In Dayton, Ohio, the Wright brothers patiently worked out the mysteries of controlled and powered flight by building designs to test theories, then rebuilding and retesting. On July 4, 1894, nine years before the Wright brothers' flight on Kill Devil Hill and two years before Henry Ford put together his first motorized carriage, Elwood Haynes of Kokomo, Indiana, tested his new automobile by driving it down Punkinville Pike and through the streets of downtown Kokomo. Sixty miles south in Indianapolis, Carl Fisher was involved in the pluck and daring of the times. By 1908, he was an established Oldsmobile dealer, real estate developer, co-owner of Presto Light, which made carbide headlamps for automobiles, and an extraordinary entrepreneur and promoter. The man also loved racing. Fisher had raced bicycles, hot air balloons, and power boats. In later years, he literally sold swampland in Florida as the primary developer of Miami Beach. On a golden autumn day in 1908, Carl Fisher and Lem Trotter were driving home from a business trip in Dayton, Ohio, when a problem with Fisher's Stoddard Dayton touring car forced them to stop for the fifth time of the day. Fisher was furious. He believed American cars weren't tested for quality like the European automobiles he'd seen at the Gordon Bennett Cup races in France three years earlier. Lem Trotter, who was Fisher's advisor and real estate broker, challenged Fisher to finally build the racetrack he'd been promoting, a place where American manufacturers could test their cars under the most grueling conditions. Trotter found the proper site. 320 acres of level farmland northwest of Indianapolis, and Carl Fisher persuaded some of his influential friends to join in his next great adventure. In February 1909, Carl Fisher and three industrialist partners incorporated and capitalized the Indianapolis Motor Speedway with $250,000. Carl Fisher was unique no matter how you look at him and no matter what part of his career you look at. Because Carl Fisher, like many other people, could get ideas or dreams. And he was able to convince other people to follow him toward his dream. The Speedway's original plan was a three-mile rectangle with a twisting two-mile course through the infield for special events. Fisher wanted the track completed for a 1909 race. P.T. Andrews, an engineer from New York, convinced the board to scale back their plans to make better use of the space. 
He proposed an oval of two and a half miles, with each straightaway five-eighths of a mile in length, each turn one-quarter of a mile, and each short chute between turns one-eighth of a mile in length. The track was 50 feet wide on the straightaways and 60 feet on the turns, with a maximum turn bank of 9 degrees, 12 minutes. It would all fit neatly into a one mile by one half mile piece of land and leave room for more grandstands. More importantly, the racetrack could be finished in time for races that year and the investors could start getting a return on their money. Workers immediately began grading and building. In June of 1909, while construction was still in progress, the national balloon races were held at the Speedway. 3,500 paid to watch from the Speedway grounds, and 40,000 watched for free outside the gates. The track was ready in August. The surface was made of crushed gravel covered by tar. Several motorcycle races were held, but most riders left before the races began because of the dangerous surface conditions. The following Monday, on August 19th, the first auto races on the track proved the danger. One driver, two riding mechanics and two spectators were killed. Several drivers suffered broken goggles and eye injuries from flying gravel and a disintegrating track. The final race had to be stopped early. The whole enterprise was in jeopardy without a better racing surface. The Speedway investors decided to pave the track with bricks, the most advanced surface of the day. Workers laid a brick track in 63 days, using more than 3.2 million paving bricks weighing 10 pounds each. It was laid with a precision that varied no more than 3 eighths of an inch for every 12 feet. The new surface earned the track the lasting nickname of the Brickyard. The bricks were not fully paved over until 1961, and even today, a three-foot strip of original bricks marks the start-finish line of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Beginning on May 27, 1910, a total of 42 automobile races were held on the new track during a three-day period, with only one injury, a broken leg. In June, Wilbur and Orville Wright showed up for Aviation Week at the track, and one of their planes set a new altitude record of 4,384 feet. During that same week, a propeller-driven car raced an airplane for two laps, or five miles. The plane won, but only by four seconds. Additional races were held over July 4th and Labor Day weekends of that year, but it was too much of a good thing. The dwindling crowds convinced Fisher that the Speedway would make the most money by offering one spectacular race in 1911 at the impressive distance of 500 miles and with the largest purse in racing, $25,000. The racing world was awed by the enormity of the event, but some newspapers predicted blood and carnage. The track now had inside and outside retaining walls which gave no room for mistakes. Carl Fisher was undaunted. He predicted, we're going to have the biggest damn crowd anyone in the country has ever seen. The first Indianapolis 500 race was set, and the automotive world would never be the same. The 500 is one of the great community celebrations of American history. It's equivalent to a World's Fair. It's equivalent to a Mardi Gras. It's equivalent to any time when the community meets, not just to enjoy itself, but to celebrate its values and its ideas. I think one of the basic attractions of the Indianapolis 500 for anyone in the world is that this is a place where that ancient human drive for competition is showcased for everybody to witness. The United States was settled with the idea that we would be an example for the rest of the world. And I believe the 500 is the example for the rest of the world about man's ability to harness, to focus, and to build the fastest machines for racing. 
Well, the Indianapolis 500 is still just a race. It's also still the Indianapolis 500. The reality has become even bigger than the dream in Carl Fisher's mind. Roaring through the century, trailing sparks of glory, a genuine spectacle and cultural phenomenon. It can be appreciated by casual observers once each year, but it is loved by lifelong fans. The first Indianapolis 500 race was a perfect expression of its times, featuring new machines and courageous men. 80,000 spectators came to watch the first running on May 30th, 1911. They arrived by special trains from New York, Cleveland, St. Louis, and Chicago, and from surrounding states by buggies and cars and trolleys from all over Indiana. In the stands were men who had fought at Gettysburg and men who had charged up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt. Even Henry Ford was there. He took this picture. Admission was one dollar. In the pits were the fruits of long work by major manufacturers and race car drivers. The new race was important enough and rich enough to bring the 1910 American Automobile Association champion Ray Haroon out of racing retirement. They called him the Bedouin because of his Arabian ancestry. Haroon qualified as one of 40 starters driving his Indianapolis-produced Marmon Wasp, but he was almost disqualified at the last minute because the Wasp was a one-seater with no riding mechanic. There was no rule at that time that said that you had to carry a riding mechanic, but just everybody did. And uh, so uh, during practice, Ray Haroon had this specially built Marmon uh, with a, a single seat streamlined body and no riding mechanic. That was the idea because you could save weight by not carrying one. And uh, there were complaints from the other teams that uh, he was a safety hazard. And one of the roles of riding mechanics at the time was to keep the driver uh, aware of uh, whether somebody was coming up on one side or the other and they would, you know, do this kind of thing. And uh, so they complained that he was a safety hazard out there by himself. So how he got around it was to go downtown and buy a mirror. It was an eight by three inch mirror. And uh, he put four rods, uh, mounted them above the cowling and then uh, put, put the mirror on top. And it was up like this so he could drive along and look up and see what was going on behind him and that silenced everybody. It is believed that this was the first rear view mirror used on an automobile of any kind. The 1911 race is believed to be the first mass rolling start race with a lead car used to pace the field. The pace car was driven that first year by Carl Fisher. Imagine the experience of driving in these early races. The cars have wooden steering wheels and no real suspension. For 500 miles, every brake vibrates right through to the driver's hands. Many cars burn as much oil as gasoline, so there's slippery goo on you on the car and on the track. During the race, your riding mechanic pumps oil and gasoline, watching for traffic and paying attention to the gauges. The cars are top heavy. The mechanical brakes barely work. There are no seat belts. And on your head is a leather helmet or cloth cap. Yet, you love it. For the glory, for the money, and yes, for the adrenaline rush of speed. Tires of the day were made of cotton cord under a thin coating of rubber. They were hard, but vulnerable to quick wear and catastrophic blowouts. The wily veteran Ray Haroon decided he could save his tires and win the race if he averaged a steady 75 miles an hour, even though his wasp could go faster. He was right. Haroon won at an average speed of 74.602 miles per hour, with only four tire changes. His nearest competitor needed 14 sets of tires. At the end of the race, Haroon was so exhausted he had to be lifted out of his cockpit. Then he retired from driving again, this time for good. The first 500 had all the hallmarks of later races. Danger, drama, technology, controversy, and involvement by manufacturers from around the world. The race wasn't particularly safe, 
It also wasn't a bloodbath by the standards of the times. One riding mechanic was thrown from his car and killed. Another was thrown and injured. In all, there were four injuries and one death. Some controversy was provided in 1911 by the idea that Ralph Mulford may have won the race, but was not credited with a lap due to the distraction caused by this rather incredible accident. The first race also included international drivers and automobiles. The Italian Fiat was there, along with the German Benz. From the beginning, the Indianapolis 500 was a very American institution, while embracing a melting pot of cars and drivers. Tony Holman was a successful industrialist from Terre Haute, 65 miles west of Indianapolis on the Wabash River. His family business, Holman & Company, had made its initial fortune in the catalog business. But young Tony had expanded it dramatically by turning Clabber Girl Baking Powder into one of the nation's top sellers. He was an able businessman who'd been a shy star athlete at Yale, a leader in civic affairs who tended to avoid the limelight and personal attention. Most of all, he was a Hoosier through and through. Tony Holman came out and was very, very shy had been to the track as a boy, and uh, thought that the 500 tradition could, should continue on. And he thought, Kentucky has the, uh, the derby, uh, Indiana should have the 500 mile race. So he went over and looked at the place, didn't seem to be that dismayed about its condition, and uh, he kept bringing friends in and said, what do you think? And they looked at the place and thought, well, it's a disaster, but one look at him, and he kind of had this grin on his face, and they thought, well, I guess the boss is telling us the answer. So they went ahead and the track was purchased November the 14th of 1945. Tony Holman bought the Speedway for an undisclosed amount, believed to be $750,000. The Holman family's era continues to this day. Tony Holman's grandson, Tony George, is president of the Speedway. By 1946, the track was ready for racing, and so was the country. The war was over. There was a renewed interest in automobiles, since they were once again being mass-produced. People wanted entertainment. They wanted family outings. In short, they wanted the Indianapolis 500 race back into their lives. Tony Holman wondered if many people would come, but on race day, there was a massive traffic jam. He then knew the race would survive and thrive. More often than not, those fantastic finishes were made possible by one or more of the brilliant mechanical geniuses who spiked the history of the Speedway every generation. People like Harry Miller, who designed the most precise, elegant race cars of anyone, anytime, anywhere. Miller pioneered aluminum pistons and blocks, intercooled superchargers, unusual carburetors and streamlined designs. Early on, it was definitely a proving ground for the manufacturers. That began to change, and then it became products that were tried out as racing became specialized. And uh, Harry Miller from Los Angeles had nothing to do with the automobile industry. He built racing cars, complete engines, chassis, and the whole works. And his reward for uh, success on the racetrack was to sell more racing cars. In the early days, Harry Miller's engines were often up against cars powered by Duesenberg engines. The Duesenberg consumer cars were of such high quality that their name became synonymous with elegant perfection. The phrase, it's a doozy, was coined to refer to anything that was the very best. Fred and Augie Duesenberg built their engines and custom cars in Indianapolis. Their race cars were in contention at the 500 from 1914 until well into the 30s, when private owners continue to enter them. Until the Depression and Fred's death in 1932 sank the company, Duesenbergs were the Rolls Royces of America. Indy's merchants of speed have given the world improved aerodynamics, fuel injection, radial tires, breakaway body parts that protect the drivers, better suspension, and computerized ways to extract the last gasp of energy from explosions of fuel and air. 
I don't think you could say that anything was invented at the Speedway, or if it wasn't for the Speedway, or if it wasn't for racing, this wouldn't have happened, or that wouldn't have happened. But there was a lot of things that were perfected. No doubt, um, tires, spark plugs, shock absorbers, uh, four-wheel brakes, the low, wide-profile tire later on, but all the way through the, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, um, there was a lot of things were perfected at the racetrack. Through the years, the Indy 500 race has seen designs that were deemed crazy. Some proved to be crazy like a fox. The first rear-engine car appeared at the Speedway in 1937, but it took until the mid-1960s until rear-engine cars became the standard at the Brickyard. On the theory that two is better than one, the 1946 Fajul twin-coach entry driven by Paul Russo sported two midget Offenhauser engines, one in the front of the driver and one behind. Russo ran well enough to qualify the car in the middle of the front row that year. In 1964, Smokey Eunuch entered the Hearst Floor Shift Special, a car where the driver sat in an appendage, like a sidecar. The car didn't make the race, which was probably good since the sidecar offered no protection in a crash. Many people are surprised to learn that a race car powered by a Cummins diesel engine not only made the race in 1931, but completed the 200 laps in 13th place without a single pit stop. Several other Cummins diesels made the race over the years, with Freddie Agabation surprising the entire field by winning the pole in 1952. It was equipped with the first turbocharger ever seen at the Speedway. In 1952, the Speedway organized a custom radio network. Today, it reaches the majority of the world's population. ABC added live broadcast coverage in 1986. There's always something to cover at Indianapolis in May. Sometimes the events are tragedies. Hemingway said, there is beauty in danger when it is deliberately sought out. In the 1964 race, Eddie Sachs lost his life in a devastating accident. Sachs, a two-time pole winner, was a favorite among fans and drivers. As a younger man, Sachs had worked in the Speedway's cafeteria just to be around drivers and cars. When the death was reported to Sid Collins, the voice of the 500 on the international radio network, he gave an impromptu eulogy that could apply to many others who lost their lives here over the years. Some men try to conquer life in a number of ways. In these days of our outer space, attempts some men try to conquer the universe. Race drivers are courageous men who try to conquer life and death and they calculate their risks. And in our talking with them over the years, uh, I think we know their inner thoughts in regard to racing, they take it as a part of living. It is God's will, I'm sure, and uh, we must accept that. We're all speeding toward death at the rate of 60 minutes every hour. The only difference is that we don't know uh, how to speed faster, and Eddie Sachs did. And so since death has a thousand or more doors, Eddie Sachs exits this earth in a race car. The first Indianapolis 500 race began the transformation of the contest into a mythic spectacle of international dimensions. The 1912 race completed the process by providing a double purse and a sympathetic hero. The greatest drama happened at the end of the race. On the third lap, Ralph De Palma put his big Mercedes in the lead. On lap 196, only four laps from the end, his engine threw a connecting rod. De Palma had a big lead and tried to nurse his car to the finish line on three cylinders and no oil. But just over one lap from the end, the engine finally froze. De Palma and his riding mechanic, Rupert Jeffkins, jumped out and began pushing the heavy car to the pits. As they came by the grandstand, Thousands stood and cheered with a roar that practically drowned out the race cars. A game brave competitor was giving it his best right to the end. And we 
with Shakespeare and Greek tragedy and Don Quixote, all wrapped up in the grease-smeared person of Ralph De Palma. But cheers didn't win the race. Second place runner Joe Dawson streaked by them and took the checkered flag. De Palma came in 11th. After Dawson crossed the finish line, Ralph Mulford was running last among the surviving cars. He knew he'd get no money unless he finished all 200 laps, so he was willing to persevere through mechanical problems, taking a record 8 hours and 53 minutes to finish 10th at an average speed of 56.29. Ralph De Palma went on to win the race in 1915, but he was always remembered best for that 1912 finish. Years later, World War II correspondent and Hoosier Ernie Pyle said, I would rather be Ralph De Palma than president. I would rather win that race than anything in the world. The 1912 race was a resounding success. New York papers were already calling it the largest sporting event in America. In 1913, the rules were changed to attract entries from Europe. It worked. Eight of the 27 cars in this race were from Europe. There were new grandstands for this race and a new Japanese-style scoring pagoda. Standing tall in the infield of the flat Indiana land, the exotic pagoda seemed to emphasize the worldwide dimensions of the contest. Peugeot sent a revolutionary car and the son of the Peugeot factory superintendent to drive it. The engine in Jules Gou's car set the ground rules for 75 years of racing and showcased features just recently offered in passenger cars. It was a four-cylinder screamer with double overhead cams and four valves per cylinder. It had already won the French Grand Prix and set a world record of 106 miles per hour over 100 miles at Brooklands in England. Race day was hot in 1913, over 90 degrees. During an early pit stop, Goo began to drink iced champagne for future stops to take the edge off the heat. Over the rest of the race, he quaffed four pints during pit stops and won by over 13 minutes. He credited the car, the crew, and especially the champagne. The number three finisher was a hometown favorite. Charlie Murs was driving an Indianapolis-built Stutz when flames erupted from the engine on the last lap. He knew he had to finish the lap to be in the money, so he stayed behind the wooden steering wheel and guided his flaming bomb across the finish line. Once again, the resounding cheers added to the brickyard's myth as a ground for heroes. European cars continued to dominate the 500 through a shortened 1916 race. Then the track was closed to take care of World War I. During the war, the Speedway was turned into an aviation depot and landing strip, and oats and wheat were grown on unused areas. It was during Tony Hullman's stewardship the famous words were first spoken. From 1946 to present, the Indianapolis 500 has steadily improved in technology, safety, top speeds, and worldwide recognition. The Brickyard's history has been signposted by desperate duels, which excited the juices of spectators and drivers, even the losing drivers. The dramatic 1912 finish with Ralph De Palma pushing his car across the finish line was just the first spectacular finish. In 1937, the 25th anniversary of the Indy 500, race leader Wilbur Shaw noticed his oil gauge near zero. There were 20 laps to go, and it was against the rules to add oil, but he had a 114-second lead. 
Doing quick mental calculations, Shaw figured he could slow about six seconds per lap and still win the race. The crowd noticed Ralph Hepburn's car creeping up on Shaw. With only 10 laps to go, Hepburn was within sight of Shaw on the back straightaway. The last lap, they were wheel to wheel and the crowd screamed itself hoarse. As they zoomed toward the final turn, Shaw went for broke, floored the big Offenhauser, and took the checkered flag only two seconds ahead of Hepburn. It was the closest race until 1982. In 1967, Andy Granatelli bought a turbine-powered car to the Speedway. A.J. Foyt commented that that's not a race car, it's a damn airplane. The car whined ahead of the pack like a quiet zephyr. But with eight miles to go, it blew a six-dollar ball bearing, and Foyt was left to fly his car ahead to the finish. On the last turn, though, he almost crashed into the pack. I had a funny feeling. I don't know why I was up with that group of cars, and I said, look, there's nobody close to me. Uh, I think I had a lap on the field. Uh, I just backed off. It's just like I knew something was going to happen, and because uh, there was a group of cars I went behind. I come off before, I could not believe, cars spinning ever which way, I said, here, I've got to get that start finish line, I'll never forget, I made a couple of zigzags and I lost them in the smoke and that, you know, I knew I went between cars, I dropped it <clears throat> to second gear and I said, whoever I hit, I'm going to hit them hard enough that I drive them past the finish line, I did have that in my mind. In 1982, Gordon Johncock and Rick Mears battled to the closest finish in history. Only 16 hundredths of a second separated winner Johncock from challenger Mears. In 1985, Danny Sullivan spun his car and was still able to win. The incident triggered a great piece of driving by Mario Andretti, who was able to avoid Sullivan and eventually finished second in the race. Like it or not, auto racing is about speed and winning plus the vicarious thrill spectators get by identifying with winners. In the early decades, racing cars were inherently a dangerous endeavor. The Indianapolis 500 was no exception. In 1927, Norm Batten added to the legend of brickyard heroism when his Miller caught fire on the main straightaway. He stood on the back of the car and steered it through the pits until it was clear of bystanders, then jumped free. Safety has improved dramatically at the Indianapolis 500 since the 1911 race. Some of the innovations, like seat belts, have found their way into consumer cars. As a safety measure, rookie tests were required beginning in 1936, about the time shock-absorbing helmets appeared. Riding mechanics who were originally required for safety functions were made optional for the final time in 1937, also for reasons of safety. An infield hospital was established in the 1920s. It's still there, and many local medical professionals volunteer their time each year. A wrecking service was available on the track in the 1930s, and by the 1960s, their responsiveness was honed to short response times. Other safety features now include flame retardant clothing, full face helmets which are attached to the frame by straps to counter the powerful G-forces, fuel tank bladders, automatic fuel system shutoffs, onboard fire extinguishers, improved tires, suspension and aerodynamics, and x-ray examination of critical parts. But the most impressive safety checks are built into the cars themselves. They are designed to absorb a strong impact by flying apart. Because of that, some of the most spectacular crashes today are likely to be some of the safest for the drivers. Fences and barriers have also improved the safety of spectators. Even the pit stops have been made safer and now are a study in teamwork. Within 16 to 20 seconds, four tires are changed, the car is refueled, debris is cleaned from intake areas, and the driver is given a swig of water. The 1960s, 70s, and 80s 
thrust a whole generation of drivers into the public eye. They shared astonishing skills of balance, mechanical understanding, and physical stamina. The Unzer family, Al Unzer, his brother Bobby, and Al Unzer Jr., won nine Indy 500 contests between them from 1968 to 1994. The family had already paid a terrible price to racing. Older brother Jerry lost his life during practice at the Speedway in 1959. Mario Andretti had only won 500 victory in 1969, but a lifetime of near misses. He bore them in good cheer. A.J. Foyt, a complex Texan, became the John Wayne of Indianapolis 500 racing a four-time winner between 1961 and 1977, and a full-time favorite of fans. After an accident at Montreal in 1984, two-time winner Rick Mears spent three months in bed and six in a wheelchair, then came back to win the 500 for a third and later a fourth time. In 1977, Janet Guthrie was the first woman to qualify for the race, with strong encouragement from A.J. Foyt. She proved every bit as determined as any man who ever drove at the brickyard. From the fan standpoint, things just got more interesting. Celebrations the night before the race became a Midwestern Mardi Gras. And the Indy 500 became ritual for whole generations of families who volunteered here during May, or simply attended with Grandpa and Cousin Jimmy. The track has always been a family event, but especially it's a place where sons go with their fathers. And it often is a linkage between generations. A father who assembles automobiles or auto parts in the factory, and a son who owns one of those wonderful erector sets, which is the dominant toy of America in the middle years of the uh, century, have something they can talk about in common. And the track, which in a sense is erector set cars being run around, is something where father and son can bond together.